Welcome back everybody to our studies in criminal law. This is in fact the final lesson on the subject of defences and actually the final lesson for criminal law fundamentally. We're going to do some, uh, some member only content uh, in relation to looking at some of the crimes that we didn't specify in much particular detail throughout, as well as talking about the concept of inchoate liability as well. But that's going to be something that we explore in a future lessons time. But for now, in terms of the free playlist, this is the end of the lessons on criminal law. We've done about 60 or so videos. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the concept of duress. It is the uh, final lesson on the subject of uh, the criminal law and on, on duress, we'll divide this up into two main subsections. And this really fits with the two main elements of duress. Firstly, we'll talk about duress by threats. And then secondly, we'll talk about duress of circumstances. Now, fundamentally, these don't necessarily, these don't necessarily indicate two uh, distinctly or to radically distinct different defenses they are still very very similar in terms of what they represent they still nevertheless have differences in terms of pardon the pun their circumstances okay uh, and the ways in which they can be levied that is why there is a certain amount of importance there so speaking first about duress in the generality Duress fundamentally is just a defence which is not necessarily applicable to um, every offence. Um, so one of the things that should be noted is that duress is not a case, uh, is not a defence, should I say, for, for murder. And we'll get to why in a second. Fundamentally as well, it is not a defence which is uh, codified in any particular statute per se. It is instead uh, part of a uh, common law and it is and it is the leading case of which is uh, the case of Howe from 1987. And let's just get into it. Let's just get into to, to what this case represented uh, and what duress represents uh, more generally. So in this case, there were two defendants who had allegedly committed murder. They had killed somebody. Uh, their argument was that they would, they were, they acted out of fear. They had feared a third party, M, shall we just say, would kill them if they did not kill the victim. So they killed someone under the threat of death themselves. The jury was directed to consider that duress cannot be a defence to murder, and so as a result of which they were um, rightfully convicted. Because even if, if duress can't be in a, a defence to murder, then it doesn't matter why the, the, the defendants killed the victim, even if it was absolutely true that, the, that this third party was going to kill them, it would be irrelevant. This was also uh, something which was confirmed by the House of Lords. They said that duress could not be a case for uh, a defence for murder. They say, quote, It is based on the special sanctity that the law attached to human life, which denies to a man the right to take an innocent life, even at the price of his own or another's life. Now, this is particularly controversial, at least in my opinion, it's particularly controversial. It understandably is the case that duress doesn't seem to be a defense for murder. And it absolutely makes sense, at least in my opinion, and probably the opinions of everybody who is watching, that the reasoning and the rationale behind the House of Lords' decision in this case, uh, and the reasoning and the rationale behind the, 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 the passage that I have here cited, is perfectly logical, perfectly rational. But it also doesn't seem to recognize the inherent self-preservation of human life. The idea here is that if the third party that was going to kill them if they didn't kill the victim genuinely had that belief, and, they, and that was genuinely something that would have happened, then the House of Lords is suggesting that they would, uh, and they should have, uh, instead of killing the victim, they should have accepted their own fate and let themselves die. Now, this makes sense as part of the basic principle of the law, that you do not attach one person's life to another, and it doesn't value one person's life more than another person's life. But... That is an objective case, at least subjectively, an individual who is uh, being threatened with murder or being threatened with death, should I say, would in all likelihoods and in all intents and purposes absolutely attach 
this value to their own life and would absolutely attach a, a subjectively heavier weight of their own life on the basis of their own simple self-preservation. So understandably the case that this is the reasoning and the rationale behind the principle of duress in the in the criminal law but still something that you can definitely um that definitely definitely critique moving on then let's look at the case of the Crown versus Hassan from 2005, another very, very important case. It was a case involving a defendant who had been charged with burglary. He had alleged that he had been threatened by a third party, let's call this third party X, who was in fact a drug dealer with a history of violence and so performed the burglary under the duress by threats. This is duress by threats specifically, essentially suggesting that he would be threatened with violence if he did not commit this burglary. Now, at the very least, you might think, well, OK, this seems like a perfectly valid rationale for this defense. However, the defendant had been associated for a while with this third party drug dealer. And so when it got to the House of Lords, it in fact was concluded that the defense of duress was not applicable. The defendant ought to have foreseen that associating with a dangerous criminal like the third party X, which was essentially testified on the basis of the defense that this was a third party who was a dangerous criminal who had performed violence and had a history of violence as well. And that this would reasonably or could have reasonably opened himself up to such a situation of coercion in the future. So by the nature of his association with this third party, it rendered the defense of duress by threats completely irrelevant. Finally, then, these are examples of duress by threat, uh, duress by threats. And this and this makes perfect sense. You can understand duress by threats very, very easily because you can understand it as uh, you go and perform this action or I'll kill you or I'll kill a family member. or I'll do something that is um, horrific. What is the difference between that and duress of circumstance, though? Well, these are technically two different defences, but they operate in the exact same way. The only difference with duress by threats on the one hand and the duress of circumstance on the other is the context in which this duress takes place. When we look at duress by threats, it requires that there is a threat made and that the threat that is made induces the defendant to commit criminal activity for fear of his or her life or risk of serious injury or fear of um, somebody else's life. Duress of circumstance, however, will occur in situations where there is not a direct threat, but the context of the situation causes them to believe serious risk of harm or loss of life requires them to commit an offence. So, for example, um, uh, Herring, the, the textbook um, written by Herring, uses the example of driving through a red light, believing the car was about to be jacked or attacked. So... Driving through a red light is, of course, an offence, a, a road traffic offence, but doing so under the belief that there is going to be an attack on your vehicle it would suggest that the circumstance has put you in a state of duress such that you have to commit some kind of criminal activity. That is essentially part of the way in which the defence operates. There was a case, in fact, in which, from what I remember, um, there was the mistaken belief that a plane was going to get hijacked, at which point, uh, at which point a number of individuals... Um, or at least it was, it, sorry, I, I take that back completely. It was a plane hijacking in which the people who did the hijacking believed that they had, um, there was there was um, threats to the circumstances. There were threats to their lives or there was threats to something going on outside of the plane such that they hijacked the plane to try and take off. That's another example of how duress of circumstance differs from duress by threat. Duress by threat is a lot more direct. It's a lot easier to understand. Duress of circumstance is a little bit more uh, nuanced. It requires there to be a some kind of factual circumstance which causes someone's fear for their life such that they commit some kind of criminal activity and induces them to commit some kind of criminal activity. But the basic standards between the two are exactly the same. And also it is the case that duress of circumstances cannot be a defense for murder. So, for example, if we use the Herring's example here of a red light and, and believing that the car is about to be attacked, you drive through a red light and you drive onto the pavement and you run somebody down and kill them. OK, um, because because of the circumstances um, essentially uh, force that to be the case, uh, that would not be a defense for murder, even in the case of duress of circumstance or duress by threats.